Well, howdy, everyone. I'm David Glazer. And I'm Marguerite Amin. And we are here with a practical guide to co-management, game sharing, and shared savings. And we'll dive into that in a moment. Uh, first, um, this is sort of more of a pub in the public service announcement department. So actually, we'll, we'll do announcement announcements, which is if the sound goes south, you can always t dial in on the number Dan's putting out. Um, and we always read the evaluations, and many people have suggested future topics on HIPAA. And we have a bunch of HIPAA webinars we've done. We, we will be doing more, fear not. But don't forget, you can watch all of our old webinars for free uh, on the Fredrickson website. So if you just type in Fredrickson and webinars, they're there, they stream, they're free. Um, so here's the PSA. And those of you who listen to me on Monitor Monday every Monday heard this on Monday, so you can you can daydream for a minute. But a bunch of clients, I think four now, have asked, can we do free telehealth screening to help people know whether or not they've got, uh, whether they need to be seen for a possible coronavirus infection? And I think the thinking is, we don't want people showing up in the emergency room with the coronavirus, and we don't want the worried well showing up. And, you know, so basically this is a, uh, an important health question, right? And so the quick legal analysis, and we're happy to send you something, and if you want, you can always call us and we'll get you something in writing, but the, here's, my, here's our take on this. Anti-kickback wise, it's not a problem if your motivation is to keep people out of the ED. You know, if your motivation is to drum up business, if it's coming from marketing, then that's a bigger concern. But if it's keep people out of the ED, no kickback issue. The analysis under the civil monetary penalty statute is a little more complicated. Um, and I don't think it is crystal clear it's okay under the CMP, but from a practical standpoint right now, it just, it's, it's a no-brainer. So the reason that the CMP is less clear because it focuses more on how the patient is going to view it. Are they going to be influenced to go to a specific provider? And, you know, there the potential answer is yes, although not necessarily for a covered service because most of the time you're going to be not providing a covered service as a result of this. So that minimizes the risk but it doesn't get rid of it entirely, but we're pretty cool with just doing it. So that's our PSA for the moment. Um, now for the promised prize trivia question. So some companies are ethical, some companies are less so. So some of the unethical companies are taking advantage of the coronavirus, a former televangelist who will go unnamed, but his name starts a, a blank dozen, uh, is pushing colloidal silver as a cure. That's not our trivia contest. There is a company that did the right thing. A vod vodka manufacturer said, don't use our vodka for homemade sanitizer because it's gotta be 60% alcohol and ours is only 40% alcohol. So don't use our vodka. We already have a winner, <laughs> uh, uh, which is impressive. So you don't need, if you haven't got your answer in, um, uh, and if you did put it in, make sure you, you put in your email because if you register, this is just a good thing to know if you send us questions. We see the name you sign in with and it doesn't always have your email information or anything else that's useful for us to figure out who you are. So if you think you just guessed right, send Dan your name and we will get to that. Now, on to the substance. So what are we gonna do? I'm gonna start us off with a kind of what is game sharing, co-management, and the like. Then, um, and Margie will chime in some there, then we're gonna go through a couple of the CMS programs, the uh, CJR Comprehensive Joint Replacement and BPCI, um, talk about those, and then the implications a little bit uh, Margie's gonna do of the anti-kickback statute and Stark proposed rules. I don't know if I should have used these pictures again because I may have overused them, but and the good news is storm chasing season's about to start and I hope to be out there. Um, if you look at this, it looks bad. Which is worse, the first one or this one? I was at the eye doctor on Monday and I went through this and I'm terrible at these. Worse here or worse here? And I think many people would say it looks sunnier here, that looks better, that puppy looks very menacing. That is in fact just a, it's basically scud. It's, it's cloud getting sucked up uh, under what's called a shelf cloud. It's gonna get really windy. We are about to get rocked by probably 60 mile an hour winds here, but no tornado. Here, there's actually a tornado on the ground. If you look uh, right there, you can see uh, debris on the ground. And often figuring out whether what you're looking at is bad or not is part of the legal analysis. And that is true here as well. Um, 
And it can be misleading, and we make it misleading by using confusing language. Uh, people use all of these different terms. Gain sharing, shared savings was around for a while for the idea that you were sharing savings between a hospital and a clinic. Uh, I like that term, actually, a lot. But then CMS used the same term uh, as part of the ACO program for uh, accountable care organizations. They called that shared savings. And I don't know why, but that's where it went. Uh, sort of co-opting the term. Co-management is a term I think makes sense. It's the idea that two organizations are jointly going to manage a program. People use these terms as different things, but they're really all the same. And I will speak for myself. I don't know how you feel about this, Margie, but I get, I find the terms here intimidating and often very confusing. And I think some of that's intentional. I think people are trying to confuse us. Um, they are, it, it's a way to sell stuff, right? Like if you're only, you are the expert. Um, I think that's right. Uh, I can say as a younger attorney, it was very intimidating at first. And uh, uh, talks like this are incredibly helpful to sort through the unnecessary confusion. Well, I, I would say as an old, like I, I you're going to talk about the BPCI stuff. I still find like what's a convener and some of the other terms, I find it intimidating. And so I'd don't be afraid. Uh, I, I think we could all just acknowledge this and, and don't be afraid of it. So the label doesn't matter. The idea is a simple one. We're going to take money that is earned either by low, well, basically by lowering costs in one way or another, or we're just going to make a payment. We're going to say we want to create an incentive and we're going to pay people who help us meet that incentive. So if you're thinking of gain sharing, a term which I like less because it sounds kind of greedy, um, or shared savings, that's kind of the idea of we're going to lower a, an acquisition cost or some other hospital expense, and because doctors are helping to lower that expense, they're going to share in it. Um, Co-management, I tend to think of more as we are making something more efficient and in exchange for improving their work on the efficiency we're going to pay the doctors, but many of the programs are both. You know, the quintessential program is we're going to run this service line, we're going to try to lower the implant costs, we're going to try to improve turnaround time, improve patient satisfaction, and that's all glommed into one thing. And I personally would like to call that co-management, but it doesn't matter what we call it, the legal analysis is going to be the same. So. You know, CMS put out a shared savings potential Stark safe harbor, I don't know, 10 years ago. It was a long time ago. And they talk about things like, you know, reducing waste and how you might save money, for example, by uh, not using a cell saver or by avoiding drug waste. Sometimes it's by standardizing. Um, it, it might be by getting more people through, you know, having a shorter turnaround time in the ER, or the, sorry, the OR. Um, all of those things are possible and you can share the money from them. Uh, this is in here mostly just to say, holy cow, look at those gas prices. Um, and that's about it. And I didn't even make a BP joke or anything. <laughs> so CMS, once again, uses, they use some weird terms where they talk about the things that they're worried about. They're worried about people stinting. And I don't know, I've never used the word stinting in a sentence, um, but basically it's the idea that you will uh, be cheap, you'll be a cheapskate and you won't give people things that they need. Obviously, when you create in financial incentives for certain quality metrics, it can encourage what they would call cherry picking, selecting healthy people over sick ones. Um, they'll also use the term steering in there or discharging patients too early, quicker, sicker. And, and CMS really throws this, these terms around in some of their preamble. It's a little surprising. They're fans of transparency and quality controls um, and the idea that you're going to take steps to make sure this isn't all about referrals. And we'll talk about the concrete things a little bit more. Now, if you, I like talking about um, co-management and gain sharing in part because there's a really interesting historical story here. If you went to a conference in the 90s, you would be told gain sharing was illegal. Then in 2000, gain sharing was characterized as legal. And so a normal person would say, what law changed? And the answer is no law changed. Throughout the, so the law that was there 
and I'm pausing for a moment to make it clear, at some point later on, there has in fact been a small change in the law, but it didn't happen in 2000 when, when the OIG's position went from gain sharing is illegal to legal. At that point, the law said that it is improper for a hospital to make any payment to a physician that would um, limit uh, or reduce services to Medicare beneficiaries. And um, although it actually was talking about unnecessary services in some way in there. And so the idea was if you create any incentive for a doctor not to provide care, it violates the law. And the law didn't change, but CMS suddenly started saying, and the OIG started saying, as long as the restriction is on um, unnecessary services, it's okay. You can pay people not to provide unnecessary services, and that's kosher. But the, law, the statute that's involved stayed the same. And a bunch of advisory opinions came out saying this was legal, all right? And it is not often as a lawyer that you can say something with certainty. This is something we can say with certainty. It is possible to develop a gain sharing, shared savings, or co-management deal that is legal. That is not the same as saying every deal is legal, but there is 100% certainty that you can do this. So there are at least 16, I think actually it might be 18 advisory opinions now. Um, and as if that weren't enough, back in 2014, the OIG came out in the Federal Register and said, pending any further notice from us, gain sharing arrangements are not an enforcement priority for the OIG unless the arrangement lacks sufficient patient in-program safeguards. So they're basically saying, well, this is not an enforcement priority for us. And I don't know of a single co-management gain sharing shared savings investigation. Maybe there is one. If any listeners know of one, send me an email. Um, but I don't know of any. It hasn't come up. The advisory opinions have some consistent themes. They like to see some sort of cap on the amount of money that can be paid to the physicians. They like to have whatever payment is out there, sort of if, if there's a per service payment, have it be tied to prior utilization so that you're not creating an incentive for people to start treating patients more. Um, another thing, and I am a huge fan of this, disclosure. And the reason I'm such a huge fan of disclosure is practical. If you're ever being investigated for something and you can say, we told everyone about it, it helps mostly because it makes you look innocent, right? People who are doing something shady generally try to hide it. And so the fact that you're open and notorious about whatever you're doing greatly reduces the risk that you get in trouble. And I think that's particularly true in a payment situation because I would assert that really a key element of a kickback is that it's secret. Because really what you're talking about is someone's judgment being corrupted in a way that people don't recognize that the decision maker has a conflict. And that's oversimplifying things. You can be open about your conflict and it still can be a conflict. So I, I'm not giving a completely legally sound answer here. But generally speaking, if you have told people about the relationship, it's going to be a lot harder to attack. Um, sometimes the payments in these deals pay doctors for their time spent on a project. That is going to be much less likely to be attacked as long as that hourly payment is reasonable. You know, if a doctor takes his or her evening to spend it at a meeting, you can pay the doctor for that. That's really beyond question. So how do you split the savings? So the advisory opinions, when I say that they're 50-50 here, I don't mean that they split in different ways of doing it, but every single advisory opinion that I have seen says that you can't have more than half of the money going to the doctor. So is that the law? Can you say we're going to give 60% of the savings to the doctor? Well, there's nothing that says you can't explicitly, but from a practical standpoint, that's I think everyone's a little skittish about it because it just starts to sound a little fishy, I think is the main thing, right? Why are we, if, if you save the money, why is a hospital getting more than half of the savings to the doctors? So there isn't a, a categorical legal prohibition, but I know I wouldn't love the idea of going above 50%. Now, there are multiple 50% that pop up in this as, a, as caps. 
I guess we'll talk about it when we come to CJR. The second, so this is gonna, this is confusing. When we're talking about a 50% here, we're saying if you save a thousand bucks, the doctor can't get more than 500, all right? Or the doctors in aggregate. Um, remember the advisory opinions are not binding. They're merely suggestive. In fact, if you're ever in a, in a case, you can't take the advisory opinion to it in front of a judge and say, um, you know, judge, you have to follow this advisory opinion. But the truth is advisory opinions are out there and, and the anti-kickback statute is intent based. And I do think that the advisory opinions inform people's intent. Um, we will talk in a little bit about it. CMS seems to get worried when the payments to physicians for savings programs exceeds what they would make in payment from CMS for the service itself. So we'll come back to that. Basically, there are four laws that we need to deal with. Um, there's Stark. Stark is the ugliest of these because it is not intent-based, and so you have to meet an exception. It's a civil law. You cannot go to jail for violating the Stark law, but you have to meet all of the terms of an exception, and the one you're most often going to try to fit in here is going to be a fair market value exception, probably, or a personal services exception. And, you know, so amongst the things there is um, for personal services, it's going to have to be in writing. You're going to have to the, the terms are going to have to be consistent with fair market value. They're going to have to be set in advance, and they're not going to be able to take into account the volume or value of referrals or other business generated by the parties. Uh, the anti-kickback statute is criminal, much worse, but it is entirely intent driven. There are safe harbors under the anti-kickback statute. We can't emphasize this enough. You do not need to meet them, and you often will not. And the fact of the matter is, if you're okay with Stark, you're probably going to be okay under the anti-kickback statute. It is possible to be okay under Stark and still have the improper intent under the anti-kickback statute, but it's hard. If you are a tax-exempt entity, like a, a nonprofit tax-exempt entity, you have to follow the tax exemption rules, which really, once again, if you're following Stark, you're probably okay. And then sometimes you'll have to think about antitrust. Not all the time, but when you're bringing competitors together, um, it's just something you'll want to give a little bit of thought to. So one of the questions that comes up a lot, how long can a program that's going to share money be? There isn't a clear answer to this. If you Google it, you'll find a lot of people who say payments are limited to one year. This is starting finally to change. I don't know why it's taken so long to change because there's an advisory opinion. And when you look at advisory opinions, the first two digits are the year. So this is a 2012 opinion. Uh, and it was in December, it was opinion number 22, looked at a co-management program that had a three-year term. And the government felt that this was limited in duration and they blessed it. So we know categorically that the government can be comfortable with a multi-year deal. Once again, that doesn't mean all multi-year deals are legal. And we don't know, it doesn't mean that anything more than three is illegal. Um, it just means we know some three-year programs pass muster with the government. Is a 10-year program okay? I'm not sure, right? The longer you get um, with, you know, without revisiting fair market value and re-baselining re it, the harder. Um, I have had lawyers who have told me, well, David, that advisory opinion only deals with co-management, and so you can't use it for a gain-sharing program. Now, ignoring for the moment that, as I said, I think those terms are interchangeable, if you read the opinion, the opinion involved a program that was doing both implant savings and cost reduction through things like cell savers and things like that, and meeting various metrics. So it was a multi-pronged program involving what I think anyone would call both gain sharing, shared savings, and co-management. So the people who, who talk about it as being a co-management deal merely because that's how the parties in that particular advisory opinion referred to it are mistaken. So the ultimate test is the payment has to be reasonable. And I think that's the hardest thing in here is what is reasonable. And I don't know the answer to that question. Fair market value experts can come in and give opinions on it. I think it's hard to say how much should a doctor make if you know, if you move a quality metric, if, if the hospital is at the 25th percentile in the country on infection control and they go to the 12th, what's that worth? I don't know how you value that. Um, there are people who will tell you they're experts in that, and I hope they are. 
I don't know. So first question we're going to talk about more in, the, in the, some, we're going to do some three real examples. And so do you need a new entity? And the, the legal answer to that is you do not need one. There are times it might be useful and we'll talk about some of those. You do need to make sure the terms are clear. And I think one of the biggest factors is making sure that whatever payment you set up is really in the control of the people who are going to get paid. Um, you know, I'll give a couple of examples. I don't know, Margie, if you have anything you want to chime in on here. But so here, like, here's a, a real world example of a way you can screw up a, uh, um, a co-management deal. We're going to pay you orthopedic group for uh, on time starts. And we're going to set up, if 90% of your cases start on time, we will pay you a bonus of $100,000. Um, well, and actually this is more how it gets screwed up for the orthopedic group than for the hospital. But you're the orthopedic group and you show up on time for 99% of the cases. And the metric was 90%, you're good. And you don't get a single penny because in 8% of the cases, anesthesia, was, anesthesia wasn't there. And another 4% nursing hadn't brought the patient down. And so the on-time starting percentage is really, uh, I didn't do the math perfectly, but 87%. Well, how do you fix that problem? The metric has to be that the orthopedic surgeon is there and ready to go. So you need to make sure that the metrics are in control. Press Ganey scores are another example. Um, we were talking about the pharmacist before we went in. Pain management was a big factor in Prescani. In fact, I think we would speculate that pain management is a factor in the opioid epidemic because physicians had an incentive to prescribe opioids to improve Prescani scores. Prescani scores can be affected by how people, how happy people are with the food in the hospital or how quickly nurses respond to call lights, factors that are totally outside of the doctor's control. Are some of the metrics in the control? Yes, but you have to be really careful. So another thing that we often talk about is not just making sure that the metrics are clear, but making sure that you understand any cliffs that are involved in uh, the metrics themselves. So if you have to surpass a certain level to even be eligible for the payments, making sure that not only are those things that are in your control, um, but that they're well-defined and um, meaningful and attainable measures. And so you, you would recommend a graduated, a graduated program? Like what would... What, what? Well, it, it obviously depends on, on the particular arrangement, but uh, a graduated program would work or um, anything where it's clear that there are attainable thresholds um, and it's not just an all or nothing uh, with something set outside of your control. Yeah. And so, you know, like to me, it, it, let's use the on time start example again. You know, it might be you get some payment at 85%, some payment at 90 and a bigger payment at 95, right? And you can have a, a cliff is legal, but it can often generate a lot of frustration if someone gets really close to a metric without actually hitting it. So thinking of it as more, I like the rheostat rather than light switch analogy. I talk about that with risk a lot. And I think of the same thing here. Um, okay. So now I'm just going to tell a story. This is purely a how things go south. Um, and it's not a story about that car that was really close to that tornado. Don't drive through tornadoes at night. Don't storm chase at night because that poor car was really close to, uh, you can see right there, there was, that actually became the, the, prettiest nighttime tornado, about well, the only nighttime tornado I've seen, but I, uh, Follow your own advice, David. Yes, I don't, well, I wasn't chasing. We were just, we were driving and I saw that and said, we better pull over because I don't want to go near that sucker. Um, okay, so this is pulled right out of the Des Moines Register, all right? So this in, uh, large quotes out of a Des Moines Register article. According to her lawsuit, Kathleen Davis suffered a significant complication after having a Medtronic pacemaker implanted at Methodist in 2004. She said that her cardiologist made a startling confession when she asked what happened to cause a twitching in her abdomen. He told her that she probably would have fared better with another brand of pacemaker. Great decision there. But the Methodist administrators had leaned on him to install the Medtronic model to help the hospital collect on what he called a kickback deal, the lawsuit said. Uh, and this is old now. This is from, you know, 14 years ago. There's a lot going on here, right? So a doctor has got a patient who's unhappy with the result, and while complaining about the result, he decides to deflect the blame from himself 
onto the hospital by saying the hospital made me choose this particular implant. So that was a brilliant decision. Um, Frank, the physician, has made no attempt to comply with the contract. I'm prepared to reschedule his devices to be in compliance with the contract, wrote Tim Nelson, a hospital manager who has since left the company. And then and what's kind of crazy about this is just coincidentally how names play out. Uh, in another email in the court records, Butts, another administrator, wrote, Frank did say that he would abide by the contract that paid him money for compliance. In the email, which Butts wrote to the Methodist chief operating officer, David Stark, and how you could get a Stark worked into this is just beyond me. He said, isn't there a joke along these lines? Now that we've established what he is, we're simply negotiating over price. Now, I was not involved in this deal at all. I know nothing about the terms of it. But I'm going to say with some confidence, I bet the deal was perfectly legal and perfectly kosher. And what happened is we took a perfectly kosher deal and a bunch of poorly worded emails have made it really fishy. Or not fishy, but they're going to cause trouble, right? What people have said to characterize a legal program is making it problematic. And so that's the takeaway lesson, first of all, is I think just don't use email much when you're dealing doing any programs like this, because whether it be a joke or the comment, hey, this program will be great, think of all the business we'll generate here, one email like that makes the deal illegal. Now, the fact that, to be honest, a statement like that, not an email, is still the, the same problem, right? And you should always assume people are recording you too, but the email is going to be there for sure. Uh, and maybe people aren't always recording you. So you got to choose your words pretty carefully. Um, when you're setting up a co-management deal, I would try to refrain from having the device company directly involved in the relationship. We work with some really big and good device companies, and we have sometimes get adv asked advice on some of this. And it is perfectly okay for... Um, you know, a hospital to choose to use exclusively one company's devices, but that decision should come from the doctors and the hospital, and it shouldn't be driven by the device company. That's going to greatly increase the risk of these deals. Um, okay, so let's look at some examples. Uh, and just, oh, I do want to mention, you know, people sometimes think about the risk here, and there's risk in life, and we do every deal you enter into in the healthcare world comes with risk. And co-management, I would say, not only doesn't come with more risk, if done in, with any basic standards, is probably lower risk. It is okay for a hospital to say to doctors, or an ASC, right? Um, so anyone basically can offer a doctor compensation for improving quality and reducing cost, and I think it's a good idea if you do it the right way. So let's pick a couple of examples. So a hospital wants to lower its implant costs. And so it's thinking, hey, we'll give 50% of whatever we save with the orthopedic surgeons. Can we do that? Um, and you know, the answer should be pretty clear now. Yes, you, you absolutely can. With the asterisk of is at what point is the savings too much? And I don't feel qualified to opine on that other than to note that there are a whole boatload of advisory opinions allowing 50% savings. Now, does that mean if the savings are a really big number, it's still okay? In theory, yes. Um, you know, but, it, but someone could choose to argue, you know, if you save the hospital $10 million, can the doctors get $5 million of that, even if they didn't, if, if their whole contribution was agreeing to standardize and choose device X over device Y? The advisory opinions would seem to suggest the answer is yes. Um, could you make that share 75%? Well, as we talked about, I would say I wouldn't, but it isn't categorically illegal. So do the surgeons need to set up a new entity? I think that depends a lot on how they're set up. If you've got a relationship between a hospital and one clinic, there isn't really that big a reason to create a new entity. You can just have the payments go to the clinic, and I think that's fine. Um, you know, or if it's one doctor. Where things get more complicated is if you've got some sort of program where multiple groups, you know, you've got three cardiology clinics in town and they're going to get together jointly to do it, then one entity can make sense. Uh, I'm setting up a new entity can make sense. Can the hospital include its employed physicians in the program? 
Absolutely. And this is something I think some people are skittish about, but there is no reason that employment should change the analysis here at all. Um, employed physicians can get paid to lower costs. You know, you can, you can do bonuses for lowering costs or improving quality. This, the analysis is identical. All right, you've got a hospital that's got a crummy door to cath time. And so they're like, maybe we can improve that if we say, if we move from the 75th to the 50th percentile in our times, we'll give the doctors an amount of money. So conceptually, is that legal? Absolutely. And the only question is, how much is too much? And I think that's the hardest thing, and this is where I feel unhelpful. I can't tell you how much is too much. And I even am a little skeptical of how, I don't know how the consultants figure that out. Because um, the only way you could do it is you could look at other programs. And one of the ideas for fair market value analysis is you're not supposed to be comparing your benchmark to other payments that may factor in referrals. And by definition, every other hospital that's doing the same thing could be taking into account referrals. So we're at a conundrum. Now, what if instead of doing percentile changes, you want to make something. So percentile changes is something that's not in your control, right? You can make things a lot better, but if everyone else makes things a lot better, your percentile is not going to change. So could you say, if we take 10 minutes off of the time, something that's much more in your control, we'll pay you money. Yes, that's also fine, right? You just have to make sure whatever metric you're choosing is a real one so that the payment is meaningful. But whether you tie it to... Um, What's the word I'm looking like? A, you can grade on a curve or you can do it on absolutes. Either one's okay. So a bunch of patients are really unhappy with the OB department. And so the hospital wants to turn things around. And so they say, we're going to turn over management of the service line to the biggest OB group in town. And we're going to link the pay to patient satisfaction scores. And really, what says patient satisfaction like, like, uh, people showing up, right? And so if we can double the number of deliveries, we will pay an extra bonus. So Margie, what, how, how do you react to that? Uh, so I think patient satisfaction scores are a fine metric to be including. That's something that is along the lines of the quality components we've been talking about before. Uh, an increase in deliveries is uh, highly suspect. And well, why? I mean, people vote with their feet. What's, what's the problem? Well, that is closer to a direct payment for referrals or for sending specific patients to a specific hospital. So that is um, not only suspect on its face, it's going to look very bad to any sort of uh, enforcement uh, agency coming in to look at this. And I think that's a perfect example of how what seems, you know, like I can see a marketing person thinking, well, let's pay people for improving the bottom line, right? And there's basically, I mean, this is a little unfair, but generally speaking, paying for lowering costs is going to be much better than paying for increasing revenue. Um, and so both affect economic performance, but savings are way better than revenue. Now, here is an interesting question. We had a fun little discussion about this recently. Is it better or worse if you make the offer to every group in town? Um, so I don't know. I mean, you could make, so what do you, I don't know. Is it better or worse? Margie, yes. Uh, when we were talking about this before, we could play out the argument either way. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you. Uh... you know, so, so I would say, so one way, all right. So if you, the first problem is if like managing a service line, every group's going to do it. Is that real? Right. I mean, there's something about that that just sounds fishy. How many cooks are you going to have in the kitchen? And so that sounds really fishy. The positive of expanding, you know, making it available to everyone is a positive in terms of you're not linking it to the volume or value of referrals, right? If you only offer this program, here's an interesting dilemma. The best managers are going to be the people who are there the most, right? But if you only offer this to the people who are there the most, it does make it possible for someone to say you're giving it to the people because they're a good referral source. Um, and I think the answer is you want to make sure that your record shows why you're picking them and why you think they're good managers. Management is one in particular. I think offering management to everyone is fishier than savings to everyone. I think savings to everyone, regardless of the number of cases they bring, is okay. And one theme that's in the advisory opinion 
is let's say Margie is at this place and she's bringing 50 cases and I have historically brought 25 and we're gonna do some program on the savings. You cap the payment to Margie at 50 and me at 25. So if I start bringing all of my cases to the hospital as a result of this program, I don't get more money. Um, and so that is a great way to solve that problem. All right, uh, now we're gonna turn our attention to a few of the formal programs put out by CMS, or um, rather they're put out by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI. Um, and CMMI was established by the ACA with the task of developing and testing new healthcare delivery and payment models, um, all with the idea that it would um, uh, come up with alternatives to the traditional fee-for-service Medicare payment model. Uh, so the idea behind these models is to um, put out kind of temporary programs or models. These are typically lasting less than five years, although as we'll talk about, some of them have been extended beyond that point. Uh, and these are all experiments aimed at kind of identifying what might be successful concepts with the goal of then term terminating them into more uh, permanent programs. Uh, what I have up on the slide are just the various categories that uh, CMMI has um, used to describe the various different initiatives. Uh, we're gonna talk about what CMMI calls the episode-based payment initiatives. Um, these are some that have kind of traditional game sharing components like what David's been talking about um, so far. Uh, but the big difference here is that these programs operate under express approval from um, both OIG and CMS. So um, as a result, they operate kind of outside of the typical game sharing guardrails that, that David has been talking about. Um, as the name would suggest, uh, these episode-based payment initiatives hold providers accountable for cost and quality components of care provided during a defined or particular episode of care. So at the moment, there are three um, programs in this category of episode-based payment initiatives, and we're gonna focus on two of them today, so uh, BPCI Advanced and CJR. Um, and I think we wanna, as a threshold matter, to say this is a very difficult topic to um, discuss on a webinar because we have people out there who are listening and wondering um, what are all these acronyms that we're saying and what are these programs uh, to others who are pretty well versed in these programs and are participating in, in the thick of these. So our goal today is really to just cover some of the basics um, and discuss a few interesting kind of risk sharing components of, of the programs. Uh, we're not going to cover the oncology care model, but I will note that uh, CMMI is currently in the process of form formulating the successor version of that program. Um, that's gonna be called the Oncology Care First model, so really different. Um, and it's a voluntary model that they anticipate running uh, starting in January, 2021. So more information will be coming about that uh, program and certainly feel free to let us know if you're interested in hearing more about that in future webinars. So we're going to first cover CJR, and then you'll hear from me a little bit later covering BPCI Advanced, and then we'll just have a few comments at the end about uh, potential implications of those proposed rules. So I will say right now, if you are not interested in CJR or BPCI Advanced, feel free to log off uh, now or at a, at a later point, we won't be offended. I, or not, at least I won't. At, David? I'm never offended. Nothing <laughs> offends me. Um, so I'm gonna go through CJR really fast for kind of two different reasons. One is we did cover CJR at some length in an early webinar right when it first came out. And so you can go and see that. And second, I think people are generally in it or not, and this is kind of to Margie's point, if, if you're in it, you're gonna know this stuff, and if you're not, you probably don't care about it. But I'm gonna try instead to focus on lessons that might apply more broadly, not just to CJR. And so it, like if you understand what the program is, it's saying, if you do a total hip or knee replacement surgery uh, at a hospital, you're gonna get a target price for all of the care that's provided to the patient during that hospital stay and for 90 days following discharge. And we're gonna figure out what we think it should cost for that bundle of care. 
And if you save money off of that, you'll get it. If you come in above it, you got to pay us back, right? So that's the program in a nutshell. And one of the crazy, so, you know, basically, um, the more you save, the more you can keep. Um, but there's, a, you, there's both up and downside risk in this thing. It isn't just savings. You can have to pay. The two big things I want to stress, one, if you didn't meet certain patient quality metrics, you didn't get them. Even if you saved money, you didn't get the savings. And in particular, you had to be in the uh, top 70% on two different quality metrics. And if you failed on either of those two, you didn't get your money. And I think many people got into this program without understanding that. And which is huge, right? Because you do the work, you get to the end, you've saved the money, and you haven't met one of the two quality metrics, no payment for you. So first big lesson, know what all of the ways in which you can fail are. And then the second one was that the hospital was, um, you, you have all of the responsibility for care that happens after discharge, but no ability to control it. You can't restrict patients' freedom of choice. You can't say, patient, for your therapy, you have to go to this very economical therapy provider. You can't go to the fancy dancy therapy provider. That was prohibited in the program. And so you have all of the responsibility and none of the power. And that's another thing that you want to avoid in these programs. So I'm not going to go through most of the rest of the, I'm going to go through them really, really fast. You know, in the lingo department, you know, you talk about collaborators and other terms and stuff like that. And there were these participation agreements. I'm not going to go through all that. You can watch those slides. I just want to reemphasize having responsibility but not power bites. Um, the definition of episodes of care, this is the stuff that was in it. Hospice is in it. So you did a knee replacement on a patient and the patient gets diagnosed with esophageal cancer two weeks later. You're responsible for that, what happens there. That's whack-a-doodle, right? But it was part of the program. Now, in theory, because they were using data for all kinds of other people, in theory, you know, it's, it's baked into their math. So I guess in some ways it works because they were using data from other experiences, but good grief. Um, okay. I do want to mention the limits on risk sharing, and because this is super confusing. I was just talking with a doctor who I consider to be an expert on this, and he did not understand this because it's too confusing. So CJR says that when a hospital makes a payment to a physician for participating, uh, uh, oh, and CJR is comprehensive joint replacement. So it's, that's the hips and knees. So if you're getting a payment under the program, the payment to a doctor cannot be more than 50% of what the doctor makes for all of the work uh, he receives from Medicare for the professional component of the services she or he provided. All right. So let's, and I want to differentiate this from the other sort of 50% cap. So let's say um, you did a program that saved $100,000. The doctors under the 50-50 analysis that we were talking about before, where the doctors would only get 50% of the savings, in theory would only get 50,000 of that dollars. But let's say that the doc doctor's um, total Medicare revenue for the professional component of hips and knees was $30,000. That doctor can't get the 50 that was saved. They can only get 15, which is half of the $30,000 in professional fees that they've provided, all right? Now, I don't know if real, how realistic it is. Could you save $100,000 and only have $30,000 in fees? I don't honestly know, but that's how this works. The good news is that there's a proposed rule that Margie will talk about that is, going to, that is proposed to get rid of that second 50% cap, the, the cap that is on the percentage of total Medicare receipts. Um, all right. In any sort of co-management deal, the things as a doctor you're going to want to think about and as a hospital, is there a cap on your upside? Is there a cap on your downside? Do you have control over what might make you lose money? And what's your worst case scenario? Um, in theory, you can have an agreement that pulls multiple parties together. Those are going to be really hard to administer. One of the other things is that when clinics get these payments, they have to figure out how to distribute the money. And CJR did something crazy. 
Historically, I would have said that the clinic can always split the money equally. CJR set up the idea that it couldn't be equal because you couldn't pay doctors who weren't actually involved in the CJR program. So if you had a multi-specialty group, the primary care docs, for example, couldn't share in the CJR payments. Well, that's a little surprising because you'd think that they'd want to have like an equal split would be okay. CJR wouldn't allow that. And then any of these programs, you have to kind of monitor, is it going to be okay to split the money evenly or not? And it also even oddly set up the idea that it's not only okay to pay doctors who do more and more, but you have to pay doctors who do more more. And if you think back to Margie's point about not wanting to incentivize uh, overutilization or to, you know, to incentivize referrals, this is contrary to everything that you've understood, but it's something that CJR did, and it sets up the idea that maybe in some co-management deals, it might be defensible to have the person who does the most cases make more. It's an interesting idea. And then I just, these slides are here. Know what the quality metrics are in whatever program you do. Here were the metrics for this one, and you had to be in the top 70% on both of those. And by definition, 30% of the hospitals aren't going to be in the top 70%, right? And since there are two metrics, um, you know, something like 40% of hospitals are not going to be eligible for any programs here. All right, so as David uh, mentioned, uh, we have a new proposed rule for the CJR program. Uh, so this was uh, just issued on February 20th. Um, and as with kind of all of our webinars, we don't typically go into a lot of detail on proposed rules. We like to wait and um, provide you guys with a kind of final analysis. But we are still within the uh, comment period here, and there are some kind of bigger changes that we thought you should be aware of. So the first is that they're planning on extending the program um, to run through the end of 2023. So that'll take it through performance years six, seven, and eight. Um, they're making a bunch of other changes to be actually consistent with the uh, BPCI advanced program. Um, and throughout the preamble, CMS uh, talks about how um, they are endeavoring to make while these models overlap, uh, to make them as consistent as possible. Um, so that includes removing the 50% uh, cap, uh, like David mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that was a, a corresponding change that CMS had made in the BPCI Advanced Program last year. They're looking to switch to a single reconciliation period. Um, they're revising some of the reconciliation calculations. Um, and a few other um, miscellaneous changes. Comments for this are due uh, by uh, April 24th. Um, so if any of these things uh, are of particular concern, uh, it might be something you want to make a comment on. All right, so um, moving on to BPCI Advanced, uh, and I'm going to do my best to help navigate through all of these terrible acronyms, um, but BPCI Advanced stands for Bundled Payments for Care Improvement Advanced. And this program builds on an earlier iteration in CMS's first kind of foray into bundled payments that was called BPCI. Um, and we now refer to that program as BPCI Classic. So you might hear those terms thrown around. Uh, the Classic model ran from uh, 2013 and ended in 2018. And then since 2018, we've been working under the um, advanced version of the program. Uh, there was a condensed kind of quarter-long um, model year in 2018, the first full model year in uh, 2019, and then we just kicked off model year three on January 1st of 2020. Um, so as David kind of already mentioned, you're sort of in or out on these programs. Um, CMS has indicated that on this one, they don't intend to offer another general application period to allow more participants into the program or more episode initiators into the program, but there are still opportunities for those um, current participants uh, to add or remove clinical episodes, um, and of course, the voluntary programs, so there is the option to exit the program. So it's a retrospective payment model, and I, you know, I don't think I need to go into too much of the detail here because it's 
essentially very similar to the CJR program, where it's looking at a uh, total cost of care during a clinical episode. Um, they're encouraging clinicians to try to do care redesign activities to lower cost of care while still providing clinically appropriate services um, during that time. And then they look at all of the payments during that kind of 90-day episode, and if you're um, uh, if your costs exceed that, uh, you're at risk to pay back uh, CMS, and if your costs are below that, you're eligible for a bonus payment. Um, it also qualifies as an advanced alternative payment model or an APM uh, under the Medicare Quality Payment Program, also known as QPP. Um, so providers who are participating in VPC Advanced have the added benefit of potentially um, being eligible for additional incentive payments and waivers of some of the other requirements under the QPP program. You can literally play Scrabble. I, I know, I know. Uh, the good thing is, is I actually think CMS has done a, a pretty good job of issuing some FAQs about the, those kind of overlapping qualities. Um, so feel free to look at those or reach out to us with questions if you're um, wondering how that works. So I've already kind of explained this, but how it works is you, it, the clinical episode is triggered by either an inpatient stay or an outpatient procedure um, and then extends for 90 days thereafter. Um, the payment that uh, participants may receive is tied, again, to target prices that CMS sets for those bundled payments. Um, and then there are additional uh, quality measures that must be met in order to receive kind of the full amount of the potential payment. Uh, so in total, the, the participant is at risk for up to 20% of the total target price. So that's the potential risk if your costs exceed CMS's target. Um, and then, of course, the goal is everyone's working towards that, um, I call it a bonus payment, if the costs are below that target price. So there are just a ton of nuances um, and I would say complexities to this model, um, but one thing that makes it so much more complicated than it needs to be is the number of defined terms. Um, and the use of new terms that don't align with what they've already used in the CJR program or other models. Um, but it boils down to just a few key stakeholders involved in the program. There's the participant, and that is the entity or party that is contracting directly with CMS, and that is the entity that kind of bears the financial risk, um, and then through contractual arrangements with other parties, um, apportions and allocates that risk down to other, um, other people involved. There are the episode initiators. So those are the Medicare providers or suppliers who are actually going to trigger the clinical episode. Um, and then there's a host of other characters that can serve as NIPRA sharing partners. And NIPRA or NPRA stands for net payment reconciliation amount. And I don't think that's very helpful, but you can think about that one as the potential bonus payment. Those are the risk-sharing partners um, who would be eligible to receive either part of the NIPRA payment that comes from CMS, that bonus payment, or would potentially have to share in the repayment amount that goes back to CMS if the costs exceed target prices uh, during uh, uh, the reconciliation um, process. And then, of course, there are the beneficiaries. Um, one thing that I did want to note is kind of going along the lines of what David was talking about, about disclosure. This is a transparent program that the beneficiaries know about. They're required to receive a notification letter that talks about the existence and purpose of the program. Um, it's, it has to tell them about their right to access medically uh, necessary covered services and um, the right to choose any provider um, and not uh, that they can't be forced or steered towards one particular provider. So there are two types of participants, convener participants and non-convener participants. Um, you know, these are, uh, again, kind of nuanced terms. The vast majority of people are participating under a convener participant, and this is basically an administrative entity that helps uh, pull together multiple episode initiators 
um, and facilitates coordination, helps them with their care redesign activities, and then again, apportions um, that financial risk across. Uh, and there is the option to participate as a non convener participant. So if a, a physician group practice or a hospital wants to participate without any sort of middleman between them and CMS, then they are a non convener participant and they are directly contracting with CMS and they basically have only that financial risk for themselves. I've already covered what an episode initiator uh, is. So those though in this program, unlike other programs, it's restricted to the physician group practices or acute care hospitals um, where those clinical episodes uh, could be triggered. So that includes for hospitals, um, the outpatient procedures and outpatient departments. So back to this concept of a, the risk sharing partner or the NIPRA sharing partner. So there are a bunch of different uh, people eligible to be risk sharing partners. So these can be individual clinicians, group practices, acute care hospitals, ACOs, um, as well as the post-acute care providers. Um, and these are just the permissible partners that can share in those, those payments. Uh, in order to be one of these risk sharing partners, they do have to be participating in the BPCI advanced activities for the particular clinical episodes that um, the, the entity is on the hook for. Um, they have to be identified and disclosed to CMS, and then they have to enter into one of these NIPRA sharing arrangements, um, which you can liken to the collaborator agreement that David was talking about before, um, but it's a written agreement that has to govern the financial arrangement. Not going to go into the specifics here, but you'll have the slide to know kind of what the clinical episodes are for both inpatient and outpatient and what is new for um, model year three. Uh, in order to participate, too, I'll mention you, you just have to be, um, you have to sign up for at least one clinical episode. You're not signing up for all of those. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about risk sharing. Um, so these NIPRA sharing arrangements are what are going to govern the contributions and distributions of internal cost savings, which I'll cover, the payment that comes from CMS and then shared repayments, which are those potential um, payments owed to CMS if, you, uh, if your costs um, are over the target price. There are a, a slew of different requirements for these agreements that um, are spelled out in the CMS participation agreement. Um, and uh, a lot of them are sort of similar in nature to those kind of fraud and abuse guardrails that, uh, that exist um, in other uh, exceptions and kind of guidance. Um, but you have to execute this before uh, you actually establish the financial arrangement, um, before uh, care is furnished, and they have to be for a term of at least one year. So I do realize that we are approaching the end of an hour. I'm just, uh, we're probably going to go over, but feel free to, you know, log off as, as you need to. So. Internal cost savings. Um, part of BPC Advanced is the option to. Oh, let's put it on the remember. If you if you need to go and you're frustrated that hey, there's an extra five minutes, you can always listen to it uh, the last five minutes at your leisure online. Uh, so, internal cost savings is another kind of embedded component of this program, it fits within those risk sharing agreements and allows um, participants and group practices and hospitals all to engage in gain sharing. Um, so determining, you know, a methodology together to drive down the hospital costs and then allocate some portion of those savings. Um, they go back into kind of the broader savings pool under the program and can be distributed out to applicable um, uh, sharing partners and back to the uh, episode initiator. So again, we have some um, kind of key parameters for engaging in internal cost savings. These exist both within the CMS agreement um, as well as in uh, joint waivers that were put out by OIG and CMS. 
Um, so you have to make sure that these are um, measurable, actual, and verifiable cost savings. You have to have um, a methodology that you're using that ties in quality of care and the specific BPCI advanced activities that um, the parties are undertaking. Uh, and then there is a requirement that you apply a uniform methodology for calculating uh, the ICS across all of the NIPRA sharing partners. Um, so if you're working with numerous uh, parties to uh, engage in internal cost savings and contributions, you just want to make sure that you're taking a similar approach with each. Okay, so I've already um, alluded to this, but the governing document for, for the BPCI Advanced Program is this CMS Participation Agreement. It's a lovely 100 plus page read, um, and uh, if you are the participant, uh, you're going to know this well, but if you are an episode initiator under a convener participant, um, then you're going to want to make sure that you have a copy of that, um, because that really does govern kind of all parties' uh, participation in the program, and those should be passed through in those written sharing agreements, um, but you want to make sure that, that you're kind of aware of all of the terms, because there's typically some sort of catch-all that says you will comply with the broader agreement. There are also some downstream compliance um, aspects to the CMS agreement that makes it so that way an, an episode initiator has to have um, additional written agreements with their participating practitioners um, and outline the specific payments as it kind of flows through from the administrative entity all the way down into the pockets of the specific physician who is involved in the care. I will say the one thing that um, causes me some uh, heartburn in looking at these agreements is just making sure that the math works and aligns with both the intent of the parties um, and that the legal language, when you look back at the end of the program, will align with what the parties uh, wanted the calculations to be. Uh, there is a huge risk here if there is vague or ambiguous terms that at the end you'll have a small um, uh, bonus payment that will be wasted on legal fees as you dispute uh, what, what the calculations were actually um, getting at. So we're done with the first um, and second model years, uh, and uh, there was a retroactive withdrawal option that did prove popular, I think, largely in part to a lot of confusion that existed over the, the program requirements, and then also a lot of, um, you know, they didn't, people didn't have access to see how uh, performance was going, and so a lot of people wanted to uh, get out uh, and not face a potential um, downside uh, risk. Um, we're also seeing that certain episodes are faring better than others, uh, and they're not exactly necessarily what people were, were seeing, and we're, um, or it's not exactly what people were expecting, and we're seeing a shift then in the clinical episodes that people have signed up for for model year three, um, a shift away from major joint replacement uh, as the most commonly ex selected clinical episode to uh, now I believe the um, back and neck procedures except spinal fusion um, clinical episode is the most popular um, option selected. So I will say as, as somebody going through it, there was quite a bit of frustration as um, CMS made a number of changes um, during the first couple of years. So there are some key changes, one of which I already talked about, which is removing what existed as a 50% cap. Um, in the initial version, it was a 50% cap, not only on distributions to the practice, the group practice, but then also an additional 50% cap down to the practitioners. Um, and that was uh, removed by amendment in 2018. There are a few other changes. Um, one thing to be aware of is they also made it easier for the, um, the repayment options to be tied directly to the downstream episode initiators. Uh, and if that is happening, it will come to practices in the form of an SRS reduction agreement. Um, so uh, make sure you are keeping an eye out for those. 
All right. Uh, there are a few uh, frequently asked questions that we get about the, the program. I think the majority of these um, you should have answers to already if you're already participating. Um, but I will note that for the uh, the clinical episode, the major joint replacement lower extremity or the MJRLE episode, um, if you have selected that episode, you are on the hook for both inpatient and outpatient. There's no way to be um, to sign up for one and not the other. There are hospital and group practice precedent rules um, that you should be aware of. So in general, a clinical episode will be assigned to the physician group practice under BPCI Advanced, um, but there are some exceptions and with overlap of CJR, you should be aware of those. Uh, and then people have asked now with the addition of outpatient, um, additional outpatient clinical episodes and the uh, changes to the Medicare inpatient only list, um, whether other outpatient service locations will be eligible as a, um, as a setting for initiating a clinical episode. And at least as the program exists today, all anchor procedures need to happen in an outpatient hospital department. So ASCs um, or uh, freestanding cardiac catheterization labs, those will not uh, count. All right, so real quick, um, we, we're seeing a possible evolution here uh, and the change of approach to, to what CMS is and OAG are doing for um, these types of arrangements. Right now we have a slew of models. I think there is some efforts to try to turn some models into a more permanent program um, and then offering some of the protections that exist within those models more broadly um, in the form of uh, uh, exceptions and safe harbors under Stark and the anti-kickback statute. So we have a couple of proposed rules. Um, CMS and OIG put out uh, proposed rules as part of this regulatory sprint to coordinated care. Um, and some of this may impact uh, permissible gain sharing arrangements that happen outside of the models uh, that David and I were just talking about. Um, each of the proposed rules is incredibly nuanced and again with our approach we typically don't get too bogged down in the details on these webinars anyway um, with proposed rules uh, we wanted to just touch on a couple of them so i will say this is another area where um, there will be defined terms galore they will be frustrating and i'm not going to tell you what the definitions are today because i uh, think it's very likely that they will they will change but here we're going to be dealing with um, concepts of value-based arrangements where um, arrangements will be permissible if they cover things that meet the definition of value-based activities by entities that meet the definition of a value-based entity and they all have to be driving forward towards a value-based purpose so again those definitions are going to be key um, and it'll be interesting to see where things net out under OAG's proposed rule um, to revise the anti-kickback um, regulations, there would be three new safe harbors, um, and uh, one of them uh, would be to protect certain um, outcome-based compensation arrangements. Um, and actually, this is not a new exception uh, or a new safe harbor. This would be a modification to the personal services and management contracts safe harbor. Um, so we would have a potential new uh, uh, definition to work within here, which I put up on the slide. Um, and uh, right now, OIG is considering kind of the scope of what this arrangement should look like um, and the scope of eligible participants. I think one thing to call out is that within the OIG's proposed rule, they specifically have excluded um, certain um, organizations from the definition of a value-based entity. So pharmaceutical manufacturers um, and manufacturers, distributors, um, or DME um, suppliers and laboratories, those are all going to be excluded um, from the 
um, and a kickback versions of these value-based payment arrangements. For uh, the Stark proposed rule, um, CMS has proposed three new exceptions. And here it's a little bit more uh, difficult to say how much uh, CMS is intending these um, exceptions to cover the type of gain sharing that David was talking about earlier. I will say that within all of the preamble, there was at least one specific example that makes it clear to me that this is at least something on their mind, um, where they talked about an arrangement to share internal cost savings if a physician meaningfully participated in the hospital's quality and outcomes improvement program um, and exceeds or um, meets some predetermined benchmarks for their personal performance or quality measures. So it'll be interesting to see in the final rules how much this changes the kind of general guardrails that David had talked about earlier and how much the fundamental change versus just an explicit approval of, of what uh, kind of exists and is already permissible activity today. All right, so, uh, you know, again, we'll be looking to see kind of how things net out in these final rules. Um, and I think my takeaway from this is that these proposed rules as they stand are pretty complicated. They're certainly more restrictive than the program waivers, and that makes sense that they don't want to give uh, the kind of blanket permissive structure to all um, uh, commercial options out there. Um, but my hope is that in the uh, final rules, we will see some clarification and hopefully a little simplification, um, so that way there are fewer acronyms that we need to work through uh, in, in future um, game sharing arrangement. We only got one question, and I don't think we have a great answer for it. Um, so the question is, hey, you're right, this is confusing. Do you have any good reading material about the different CMMI models um, other than the CMS CMMI website? And I would have said the CMS CMMI. I mean, and actually, I, I learned, I mean, when I get stumped on stuff, that's often the first place I go. Um, I will go look there. Uh, for acronyms and other stuff, but I don't have another really good source. Do you? Mm, not that I can think of. Um, so, uh, so I'm sorry we can't be more helpful, but I and but I'm not surprised because it's brutally hard. Uh, all right, um, a question. I should have asked this at the beginning, and I failed. For our next webinar, we are likely to either do um, interoperability or or pricing issues. And when I say pricing, like we always read our comments on suggestions for next topics. And last month, there were a ton of people saying, what about surprise billing, pricing, that kind of stuff. So it would be, and also kind of the new hospital rule on, uh, um, uh, on pricing. So we could either do pricing or interoperability. If you have strong feelings, put that in your uh, evaluation. Thanks and have a lovely day. And uh, as you can tell, we don't know for sure what we're doing next month. We'll figure it out based on your comments and our thoughts. Thanks and have a good day. Happy Friday the 13th in advance. Hmm.